Welcome back to the Oncology Brothers podcast. I'm Rahul Gosain, here as always with my brother and co-host Rohit Gosain. And today we're starting a three-part CME series on small cell lung cancer. In our first episode today, we'll touch on the treatment landscape and the recent data from ASCO 2025. Then in our second episode, we'll focus on how to get better at managing the side effects that come along with our available treatment options. And for the last episode, we'll walk through the unmet needs and some key studies on the horizon when it comes to small cell lung cancer. To get us started today with this series, we're excited to be joined by Dr. Hussein Borgai, Chief of Thoracic Oncology at Fox Chase Cancer Center. Haas, welcome. Hi, good morning. Thank you for the invitation. I'm glad to be here. Haas, oh, thanks so much for joining us. You know, for years, small cell lung cancer has been a devastating disease. Until recently, we have seen some major advancements where, which has resulted in increase in overall survival. Let me set the stage before we start our discussion. That is, we rarely find these tumors in much earlier stage where surgery is an option, but in that case, consolidation chemotherapy is recommended. Starting out with limited state small cell lung cancer, where treatment, in fact, is or was congruent chemoradiation therapy, but now we proceed still with congruent chemoradiation therapy, but post Adriatic study consolidation with immunotherapy for two years is the new standard of care. Here, we're also eagerly awaiting Frequent MRI, can that replace whole brain radiation? So we'll see how that plays out. When talking about to extens about extensive stage, where we unfortunately have seen majority of our patients where survival is limited, but again, we are seeing that extension with our recent trials. Historically, we have used chemotherapy with addition of immunotherapy up front, and then uh, maintenance with immunotherapy has resulted in improvement in overall survival. Post ASCO 2025, we are seeing additional fluorobinectinine as part of maintenance therapy with immunotherapy, which has also resulted in improvement in overall survival. And then use of bispecific antibody, that is terlatumab, in second line and beyond has improved overall survival as well. Haas, today in your clinic, post ASCO 2025, can you walk us through what is your treatment algorithm when you see someone with extensive stage small cell lung cancer? Sure, great. Um... Definitely the, the algorithms have changed and definitely the standard of care has changed. So um, first of all, I have been a consultant and uh, on ad board for the companies that have got to be involved in the studies that you just mentioned, just as a disclaimer. So I actually just last week consented my first patients for lorbanectinine in the maintenance setting. Um, so I am actually um, uh, using the study that I was participating in and using it in the clinic. Now, do I think this is for everybody uh, is really the main question. So why do I use it in, in this setting? Well, because, you know, I think M4J is a nicely done randomized phase three study. Um, um, as in any other phase three studies, when you go into the real world and more patients are treated, probably the outcomes are going to be a little bit different. I have to admit that. But overall, if I have a patient who has a good performance status and has been able to maintain that performance status after the induction chemotherapy, not going into the maintenance phase, uh, then I think it's reasonable to discuss the possibility of using uh, lower benectoding along with uh, TASO in that setting um, with, the, with the particular patient in front of you. Obviously, if a patient, in my view, has had significant difficulties with standard chemotherapy, they still have a lot of fatigue, performance status is a little bit less than what it was when we started induction, I think we have to be careful about how we approach that and whether we want to offer additional cytotoxic chemotherapy or not. So I am careful with that. But this particular patient, you know, unfortunately, a little bit on the younger side with metastatic disease, has done very well with standard chemo IO not a lot of toxicities beyond some fatigue. So I thought it was an appropriate discussion between me and the patient to say, hey, this data is new. I know we didn't talk about you continuing on another chemo, um, but I think the results are good that, and, and we should at least consider it. So that's the way I'm approaching that. I think it's another tool in our toolbox, just like any other tools that we have. Um, it's not appropriate for every case. So you have to use your clinical judgment and try to figure out, okay, who do I offer this to or not? But it is a step in the right direction. It's the first time, again, 
that we're seeing and other maintenance studies sort of adding to the overall survival. And again, it's important to realize the survival on M forte is from induction, not from the beginning. So you're adding another two or three months on top of everything else. So the unfortunate part of all of this is that, yeah, there is going to be additional toxicities and you guys are gonna talk about that. Um, and one has to be cognizant of that for sure. But again, I think in an appropriate patient population, any survival I can get, no metastatic small cell I'm gonna take. Yeah, and again, Rohit, you touched on this, Haas, you're bringing this up as well. This is devastating disease and any overall survival here is meaningful, but selecting that right patient is important. So with M Forte, we have this immunotherapy, chemotherapy up front, and in maintenance now we're adding lorbinectin to immunotherapy. Haas, you briefly touched on this. How much benefit are we looking at? And can you also touch on the importance of growth factors? Because you brought up that we're selecting the right patient because we have to keep the side effects in mind. We have that second episode dedicated to that. But as we're talking about this treatment here, the importance of growth factor, how much benefit are we buying for our patients in front of us? Yeah. So the benefit that we're buying, it's incremental, I have to admit. It is not like we're adding another year to patient survivals, unfortunately. I mean, that's that's what we're all hoping for. So I think with the difficult to treat disease and this devastating diagnosis that we all were referring to, two to three months improvement in overall survival is better than not having yes. anything. Absolutely. Absolutely. The toxicity has to be balanced. I have no doubt about it. I'm not questioning that, but it is another three months. So now you're getting roughly three months with the addition of IO. And now we're saying you're gonna have to have three months with this maintenance uh, lorby if a patient can tolerate it. You touched upon the the, the growth factor. So um, and again, we, I follow the NCCN and ASCO guidelines and things like that. And the patients who come in with other comorbidities, I have used growth factor support. Um, I have in occasions when I have sort of had a lot of mitosuppression, uh, tried to use that uh, tricyclic in the metastatic setting with patients, but again, with a lot of comorbidities, age, I'm not using this in everybody, but you know, I've I've sort of been pleasantly surprised that it can be very helpful in maintaining actually the the marrow function. And at least based on the studies that we have, there does not seem to be any compromise on survival for this patient population. So it again is another one of these drugs that could have a role in certain patients who come in with the diagnosis of metastatic small cell lung cancer. And as you stated, Haas, that uh, these agents are rather myelosuppressive. So again, evaluating this patient from the risk factor standpoint and the age factor has to tie in where the option, in fact, is GCSF or trilocyclib. Uh, important clinical takeaway from the study has been rather this sets the new bar of maintenance therapy in extensive stage. Yes, the improvement is within months time, but again, any improvement here is much appreciated. Pause. Any nuances from the real world standpoint here? That is, if I was to start a patient on chemo derba regimen, can I now combine Lurby with the derba or will I have to switch my maintenance partner to a TESO in this setting? Yeah, really good question, Roy. I don't think there is um, any clear answer. So whatever I say is basically how I feel about it, not based right. on studies, Fair right? right? Um, I don't consider the checkpoint inhibitors to be that different. Indeed. I've also talked to colleagues who seem to prefer one versus the other based on sort of retrospective analysis of the data that's been published. So there is no safety data right now, and that's my major concern with the Dorvalumab plus, um, you know, Tarlatumab in the, in the maintenance setting. But do I really think the safety is going to be that different if you switch a taser with Dorva? Personally, I don't think that. Again, I don't have any data to back it. The other issue is that, you know, you do have to change the dose, the, the schedule of delivery of uh, Dorva if you want to continue it, because many of us in the maintenance setting would use the Q4 week, and, you know, this is a Q3 week. So it does add a little of a problem there. And then the last thing, which it's becoming even more important, even in my area, because I usually didn't have to worry about it, but you have to worry whether there's going to be insurance coverage for it if you come mm -hmm. out of kind of do that. So I think keeping all of that in mind, if you're starting with Dora, probably if you want to continue with Tarla, you should switch to a taser to avoid the scheduling conflict, the potential coverage issues that might come up if insurance companies sort of, you know, start giving you a hard time. So I think that's the that's the that's the best way to sort of proceed given the lack of data. Hopefully there will be some data with 
doorbell in a maintenance so that we can have uh, both that sort of recommendation for the insurance approval and also the safety data to say, hey, this is good. We can go ahead and do it. But I think for the time being, logically, again, I don't think there is a huge difference. But for those couple of reasons, maybe it would be better to switch. Absolutely. Rod, you started off by saying ASCO 2025, we're seeing more and more studies showing overall survival benefit. Another study was the Delphi study for terlatumab by specific antibodies. Haas, do you mind touching on this briefly in terms of the study find, uh, design and findings? Because now we have overall survival with terlatumab as well. I think this is one of the nicest stories we've had this year in small cell lung cancer, really. And in general, you know, finding an immune-based mechanism that actually works the way they're supposed to uh, and the way the drug behaved in phase one and phase two and now getting a confirmatory phase three, I think it's actually a very nice story that has developed in small cell. So let's review it. So this is a phase three study randomized to tarlatumab standard dosing versus uh, basically investigator choice of chemotherapy that could have included topotecan or other drugs, right? We haven't had anything that's beaten topotecan in 20 some odd years, maybe even more. So yep. finally, there's a drug that's beaten topotecan. Let's celebrate that, right? <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, in terms of inclusion and exclusion criteria for the study, Again, it is a registrational style phase three randomized study, so it does come with more restriction. It might not be quite as replicable in the in the real world, but if you look at the, the data, for, I mean, the inclusion exclusion criteria, it's pretty good. I mean, it's not as restrictive as some of the other studies that we have seen. I wish there was more data regarding CNS activity of this drug, because that's one thing that really, really is important, and we really... I don't feel we've, we, we have that. I've been an investigator on the phase one, two. I'm all the publications for Tarlazumab except for this one. But I would say that I would like to see more CNS activity data for it. So what did we see? Tarlazumab improved overall survival compared to standard chemotherapy. Man, that's the biggest message you can take from this. And, you know, the improvement to me is clinically meaningful. So now I'm looking at, you know, if I can do chemo IO and then, do IO with or without um, lorbenectinine, and then my patient still has good enough performance status to go on second, third line, second line setting. I'm looking at, you know, all of a sudden a patient who could have up to 24 months of survival going sequentially through some of these drugs. Haas, with regards to the CNS uh, involvement, as you mentioned, is not that robust. So after one has exhausted chemoimmuno with lorbenectidine now based on Inforte, how does your sequence change if one has CNS involvement, especially we see that commonly in this disease? Again, this is not on any guidelines. This is the way yeah. Haas is doing it. Doesn't mean... <laughs> Um, I do the frequent MRIs. If they have asymptomatic brain metastases, I am very comfortable with consultation with my neuroradiation oncologist and close follow-up to continue with the treatment with the next, like let's say in this case, tarlatumab, and observe with frequent monthly MRIs on these patients so that I can spare the potential of you know, either whole brain radiation or additional radiation. But we don't have the data. So I would say if somebody all of a sudden have multiple brain metastases, anything over, in my view, centimeter, centimeter and a half with vasogenic edema, symptomatic, I would treat the brain at that point and then proceed with my next line until I have a comfort level to say I am definitely getting CNS activity from the second line to Latumab. Right now, what we know is that basically if patients had brain radiation and went on, the disease stayed under control. That's a good signal, but it's not a clear indication there is CMS activity because everybody was treated. So frequent MRI, close monitoring, definitely see the radiation oncologist, be ready to pull the trigger, but um, monitor and sort of continue with the systemic therapy. And again, before we close, I know I said that today our focus is on the current standard of care, which is again, rapidly changing. But Haas, if you had to make any predictions on how and where the field is headed, we're seeing lorbenectidine with immunotherapy move up front. We're seeing terlatumab move up front. Any predictions on how this thing is shifting? Yeah. I, <laughs> <laughs> I think because the immune-based drugs have the potential of giving us that tail of the curve. 
if yes. terlatumab is successful to move into the front line without a lot of toxicities, that is where we're going to get that sort of coveted five-year survival that we all want in small cell. So simply because of the immune activation. Cytotoxics are good, but they're only good and give you two or three months, just like we've seen, right? Maybe there is a lot of interaction between IO and, and, and lower B and other drugs, but I think it's the immune-based mechanisms that are going to get there. And what Dr. Ann Chang at Yale has been doing as part of the SWOG, biomarkers select patient population, appropriate treatment in the appropriately selected patient. I know it's a, it's a, it's a fresh field, it's a new field in small cell, but I really believe we're getting ready to have these different subtypes, perhaps offer them something different. I think that's also a very exciting area that we should be looking forward to, that we would finally offer the right treatment to the right patient with small cell uh, lung cancer. So those are the kind of uh, studies that I'm looking forward to. Absolutely. And talking about that tail uh, that we're seeing in some of these studies is a perfect way for us to end, giving that hope for our patients coming back to this devastating disease. And there's a lot going on in this space, and hopefully we'll continue to see our patients live longer and longer with this disease. Haas, thank you so much for touching on the current standard of care for extensive stage small cell lung cancer and the recent data from ASCO 2025, which is showing overall survival benefit with lorbanectin and maintenance and terlatumab in refractory disease. For our listeners, make sure to tune in to two more episodes in this series. We are the Oncology Brothers.